Okay, in this second video for, for topic six on sediment trans transport, we're going to talk about measuring and modeling um, sediment transport. Uh, and we'll talk about sediment load measurement, uh, estimating or, or, or um, sediment loads, uh, and then the sediment transport equations that are uh, currently available to be used. Okay, in terms of measuring sediment load, we use different measurement devices depending on whether we're wanting to measure suspended load or bed load. This is an example of a device that's commonly used for suspended load. It's a depth integrating suspended sediment sampler. Um, and you have, uh, it's located, it's positioned on the end of a rod. The rod is, um, positions the device pointing upstream, so the beak is pointing upstream um, within the flow, and it's moved up and down through the water column. And as it's moved, it's collecting water through uh, a tube um, at, the, at the front end of the sampling unit um, and fills up a sampling jar, which is screwed inside this, um, this, the capsule. There's an, a pressure outlet as well, and so um, as the water moves in, this pressure builds up in the, in the bottle and that's released through this pressure outlet. And so you get a depth integrated sample of the water and the suspended material within the sample bottle and you can take that back to your laboratory to work out what the suspended sediment concentration is within the sample bottle and from that work out what the, the suspended sediment load is. Over here we have a bed load sampler, it's a Heli Smith bed load sampler, again it's on a large rod which is placed on, right on the bed of the channel. Um, material moving along the bed of the channel moves in through the, um, the metal um, uh, a hole at the front here and gets caught in the, the bag at the back which is a mesh so water can flow through but the bag um, holds the, um, the coarse material. You, you measure how long you, you're sampling the bed load for so you can you know what the, the area of the face is here so you can again you can work out what the, the bed load transport rate is from, from using that device. Now there's other devices that are available they're covered in your textbooks they have different um, advantages or disadvantages. One of the challenges when we're measuring are the suspended load and bed material load and, and, and bed load is the very high variability in concentrations, um, both within a channel cross section, but also through time. Um, and so we, we really need quite a large number of sam samples to estimate sediment load within a cross section or to get some sort of um, picture of how of an average sediment concentration um, over, over a period of time. Um, and so um, a very careful thought is needed in, into how we go about collecting sediment concentration data if our objective is to estimate um, sediment load. Okay, if our objective is to estimate sediment load, then we can go out to the field and using these devices we can um, uh, design a sampling program um, to, cap, to estimate, to, to, to observe sediment, sediment, suspended sediment concentrations and bed load at multiple sites and multiple locations, multiple times um, at different flows. And from that information we can calculate suspended load um, at different stream flows. And each of the points on um, this, uh, this plot here gives either the suspended load um, transport um, in, this is in thousands of tonnes per day, or the bed load, the bed material load transport, which is um, lower than the suspended load. Remember it was, the ratio is one to five or, or, 50, or, or one to 50. Um, this looks like about one, one to 10. And so we have a, um, a, a, what's called a rating curve which gives us the, the sediment discharge um, related to, to stream flow. And remember we used these rating curves when we were estimating effective discharge. We had the frequency distribution of flows, we had the sediment rating curve, we multiplied one by the other and the peak in the result was the effective discharge. Well, well this is how we get the sediment rating curves. And if we've got a sediment rating curve, we can take the hydrograph, so that's the stream flows through time, we can convert that to sediment load through time. And if we want to work out what the total sediment load is over a period of, you know, a number of years, we can then integrate that um, uh, over time. There's some tricks in doing this, and, and your textbook talks about, about those. Um, there's different ways, different time scales and res time resolutions you can 
perform the analysis at that affects the result. And so again, careful thought is required to work out how to do this to minimize errors. This is classically quite an error prone activity. Um, and one of the particular problems is that most of the sediment load and particularly the bed load is transported over a very small period of time at high flows. And so the sampling, the temporal sampling regime is very important um, to capture those high flow events. If you just have low flow sampling, which is obviously much easier, it's easy to wait around the river and it, you don't need to time your arrival at the river when there's a, a high flow event coming through. Um, if you just have low flow samples, then you're really not going to get a good estimate of the sediment load, the average sediment load through time. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is sediment transport equations. So say we, we want to actually estimate, we don't want to measure how much um, sediment is being transported in a river, but we want to estimate that using some sort of model, some sort of equation to estimate either the bed load or the bed material load. Now, there are quite a large number of equations that are available. I'm not going to go through them here. They're in your textbooks and I expect you to have a look through those. But there's some important challenges we need to be aware of. Firstly, the theory is incomplete. So, that, so the, the processes are not well described mathematically. Um, and that's a, a, a big problem in terms of the generalization of um, sediment transport equations. The next problem is data limitations. And I just talked about some of those data limitations and I'll, I'll go a bit more into that in a sec. And the third problem is the sediment supplier problem. So these equations typically work well where you have a transport limited um, flow. Where it's supply limited, um, then the transport capacity, the transport, sediment, the sediment load being transported is dependent on what's going on in the catchment, not the conditions at the site. Um, and so you can't estimate the sediment load from just measuring um, the hydraulic variables at the site. Firstly, incomplete theory, and we talked a bit about this um, in the first topic. We know the conditions for incipient motion, but really the hydraulics are not well described, um, and we don't have reliable um, models that we can apply for even estimating incipient motion, um, other, let alone um, estimating total sediment load. So we use empirical equations. We, we talked about Shields, described, a Shields diagram and the Hilston curve that can be used for this. Um, but uh, uh, they're, they're, they're highly empirical um, relationships. They're not theoretically based. Um, and so they're very dependent on the data that's being used to inform the equations. And that brings us to the next limitation is the data. So to get a very good estimate of sediment load, even at one individual discharge, is difficult. Um, this shows the sediment, um, the bed load uh, transport rate um, across uh, a cross-section, this is distance in metres across a cross-section, it's 80, 80 metres all the way across, but I think the, the cross-section probably just extends across this middle part here, um, and the sediment tr transport capacity on the y-axis, and you can see the high variability in sediment load across the cross-section. So you can't just measure at one individual point and use that as an average for the whole cross-section, you've got to measure at multiple points. And even if you do that once, Look at the variability in those measurements. The, the 25th and 75th percentile, which define this box, are enormous. Um, and so estimating sediment load, and that's because of the high variability through time. Bed, bed load it's, tends to be, be quite erratic. We saw that in some of the, um, the videos we saw in the introductory, in the in, introductory um, uh, ses, um, topic, that the, uh, the, the, the sediment is transported in bursts. Um, and that's what we're seeing here. If you sample when there's a bit of a burst of sediment moving downstream, you get a higher sediment load. If you, if you sample when there's um, not much sediment moving down the stream, you get a lower, a lower sediment load. So estimating sediment load reliably is difficult. The data are limitations. And the third problem is the supply problem. And so to illustrate this, let's just think about an individual hydrograph. So this is an individual flow event. We have um, a, a rise in, in stream flow and a fall the blue lines discharge. Now I'm going to superimpose the sediment load in tons per day. So this is possibly what the sediment load might look like. This is a stream which might be up quite close to the source of sediments, um, maybe in, 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 a, um, in a midland or upland stream. And as the, uh, the flow rises, 
um, sediment starts to be mobilized um, from, from along the channel or from the hill slope and delivered to the channel. And so we get increases in the sediment load. At some point, the supply of sediment starts to dwindle. There's not much sediment to supply, and so it decreases. Um, uh, and the peak of the sediment load precedes the peak of the hydrograph. This is also possible. And this is typically a site that might be further downstream. And in this case, it takes some time for the sediment to be transported um, downstream to that site. It, doesn't, it travels slower than the flood wave, and so we have um, the sediment load increasing to a peak after the flow peak. Um, and so we can imagine in both of these case, cases, we've got what's called hysteresis. The concentrations on the rising limb are quite different from the concentrations on the falling limb of that flow pulse. Um, so very hard to get a simple relationship between sediment um, load and discharge when you, when you have this effect of sediment supply imposed on that relationship. And this is just one, one case where sediment supply will, will, will affect your um, result. You can imagine, for example, in that urban stream where there's very little sediment load, you can apply a sediment transport equation and will tell you what the transport capacity is, um, but in fact the sediment load will be close to zero because there's no sediment supply at all. And this shows um, what the hysteresis look like, looks like. This is the, um, the sediment concentration, um, rather than sediment load in this case. And this is the discharge. Uh, we've got months in the year. So um, as we go through, through the months, January, um, we have uh, a, a decrease in discharge um, and a decrease in sediment load. And then when the, the rains start, we have increasing flow. Um, and we have higher concentration in this case because we've got a lot of sediment that's accumulated along the boundaries of the channel or in the hill slopes, which is mobilized. But then over time, that supply dwindles and we have a decreased concentration, even though the flow hasn't decreased. So we have this sort of hysteresis in the relationship between sediment load and discharge. So, as I said, there's a lot of different sediment transport equations. There's at least 34 different approaches that you can use. Table D2 from Garcia gives you um, a list of those and their, their relative merits or and the conditions at which, to which they're applicable. Um, uh, there's a bunch of criteria you need to think about when you're selecting those sediment transport equations. Um, and there's, another, there's more discussion of these in the ASCE review, which is also in your reading material. The important thing to think about, firstly, is, is the equation d designed for um, what you want? Is it, is, it, is it giving you the sediment transport, um, sediment load for just the bed material, or just the bed load, or for the full total load, or the bed material load? So that's the first thing, is which um, mode of transport is it modeling sediment for? The second thing you, th you need to think about is, is it, has it been developed using data from rivers that are similar to the ones that you want to apply it to. And in particular, um, are the particle sizes uh, consistent between when it was developed and where you want to apply it. If it was developed using observations in sand bed streams, you simply can't apply it to a gravel bed river, it's not applicable. Um, and here's an example where a sediment transport equation has been applied. I'm, I'm really not going to go through the details here. I expect you to do that um, yourself with your readings, and there'll be exercises related to this as well. Um, and uh, this is upstream of the dam. Um, we can see um, a, a, a large amount of sediment has been accumulated upstream of the dam. And in this particular case, the dam was going to be removed. It's the Nicholson River in East Gippsland. And the consultants here are asked to estimate the rate at which sediment that's stored in the dam at the moment, um, the rate at which that sediment would be eroded and transported downstream. So they had to apply a sediment transport equation to do that. Um, they couldn't do measurements because the dam hadn't been removed. They had no idea what the, um, the, the sediment load would be. Um, and so they applied a transport equation. And they looked at the type of sediment in the river, the sort of slopes that occur in the stream to estimate to select the most appropriate sediment transport equation for that particular example. 